Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jessa B. Destreza. And I am Joel A. Kayabiyab, saying good afternoon and welcome to the Division webinar series entitled Science, Science Content and Teaching Strategies in the, the Context of, of Most Essential Learning Competencies, competencies junior, junior High School, school grade, grade A. And to formally begin with our program, let us have first our audiovisual presentation of National Anthem. And this will be followed by an opening prayer. Sang Awit ng Pilipinas. Tagapagkaloob ng lahat ng kaalaman at guro ng mga guro, bigyan po ninyo ng pagkalinga ang aming mga guro. Biyayaan ninyo sila ng kahandaang hinangin ng aming murang isipan at huwag magsawa pag di makahabol ang turuan. Pagpalainawa ang kanila mga pusong nagdiriwang sa tuwing kami nagwawagi at nag-aalo sa tuwing kami nadadali. Pagkalooban ninyo sila ng mahinahong pagtitiga sapagkat ang landas ng kaalaman ay hindi madali. Paglingasin ninyo sa kanila ang maapoy na diwang nagpapaliyab sa kagustuhan naming matuto. Tulungan nyo silang makita ang galing sa bawat mag-aaral. Wala sa marka ang halaga kundi sa pananalik nila. Ikintal ninyo sa kanila walang pagkauhaw sa karunungan. Ang bagong kaalaman at karanasan ay di dapat katakutan. Turuan po ninyo silang masiglang abutin ang alapaap, kasinsigla at kasintayo ng sarili naming pangarap. Pagpalain po ninyo ang mga gurong nauna sa amin. Ang nagawa nila ay napapakinabangan pa rin. Tanglawan po ng iyong mabuting halimbawa ang kaguruan upang makapagtayo sila sa pamamagitan ng kanilang pangungusap. Upang makapagmahal sila sa pamamagitan ng kanilang isipan. Upang makapagbahagi sila 
sa pamamagitan ng kanilang puso. Siya nawa. God is good all the time and He made everything possible, very beautiful in His time. Yes. So how are you, Mom? I am fine, sir. How Happy are you, New dear teachers? Yes, Happy New Year. Yan. So, kamusta naman po ang ating mga dear science teachers? Mm -hmm. Kayo, ma'am, my partner. Kamusta po? Okay na okay, sir. Yeah. And we are starting to be busy again from work. Yes. Dahil tayo po ay nasa second quarter na ng ating school year ngayong taon. Yes, and how are you? how is your first grading period, ma'am? Mm, very challenging, ano mm. po, sir, dahil iba-iba po tayo ng mode of learning, especially sa grade school. Mm -hmm. We are using a modular distance learning. Yes, and for some other schools, they are using online mm -hmm. and blended learning. Mm -hmm. Ayan, so lahat po tayo mga kaguruan, nagiging abala na naman sa paggawa po ng WHLP. Mm -hmm. Ayan. Paggawa po ng mga learning activities and everything. So, we are now on the second grading period. So, there's another challenge ahead of us kung paano po natin ulit tataguyod ang edukasyon para sa ating mag-aaral. Moving on, to give us his opening message, let us all welcome our hard-working and fatherly education program supervisor in science. Let us welcome Dr. Edwin Riel Bermilio. Let's give him a virtual clap. Happy New Year, everyone. My respect and greetings to our school's division superintendent, Dr. Romeo M. Alip. To our Assistant Schools Division Superintendent, Sir William Roderick Fallurin. To our Curriculum Implementation Division Chief, Dr. Milagros M. Peñaflor. To the Program Management Team, Learning Facilitators, Science Teachers, Grade 3 to Senior High School, including Alternative Learning System. To our dearest students and parents, magandang buhay po sa ating lahat. Positive feedbacks were received from the first wave of our webinar as a good start that signified that the science department could conduct webinar in the different grade levels from grade 3 to senior high school using this platform and live stream at Bataan Science Channel. Expectedly, the task of teachers will be more challenging than before. Considering that in this new normal setting, we in the SDO Bataan need to embark appropriate strategies and approaches to be able to realize our desire to make science education continue amidst this health crisis. This second wave of our webinar series is aiming again to enhance the content knowledge and pedagogical skills of our science teachers as necessary preparation for us to effectively deliver the most essential learning competencies and skills to our teachers and learners for the second quarter. This webinar series is only part of what we intend to do under the new normal to augment the educational needs of our students. It is a perfect tool that offers a myriad of information on science content, teaching strategies, and innovation in support to science curriculum that will help them to adapt to changes in the latest teaching and learning system under the new normal. To our learning facilitators and program management team, thank you very much for accepting this challenge. I know we can do this with God's grace and we will be able to survive and face the whole new world of educational learning experience with confidence, integrity, and most of all, with the different competencies that we have. 
Maraming maraming salamat po sa lahat. God bless everyone. Keep safe po. Well said and thank you so much to our EPS in Science, Dr. Edwin R. Bermilio. Truly, your words of wisdom inspired us all the more to bring education to our students. Truly, you made us uh, strong, you made us more positive in carrying the education through online and modular learning. And to give us more message and to give us inspiration, it's my honor and it's my pleasure to introduce to you our mother, our very own CID, CID chief, Dr. Milagros M. Peña Flor. Hello everybody, good to be with you again after the first quarter. Here we go to the next station, the second quarter. Thanks to you, my dear science teachers, for the continuous effort of providing our learners with skills, not only for mastery, but most importantly, for developing higher order skills on critical thinking and creativity. My gratitude to our science supervisor, Dr. Edwin Berbilio, for all the initiatives, this, uh, this move really provides our unit, the Curriculum Implementation Division, a great help in realizing its goal of providing basic education services to our clientele. On behalf of our school's division superintendent, Dr. Romeo M. Alip, I would like to congratulate the science department, our teachers, our department heads, our principal science coordinators for improving science instruction that eventually lead to improving learner performance. Thank you for all your efforts, congratulations, and God bless us all. That was really an inspiring message from our CID Chief, Dr. Mila Peña Flor. Thank you so much, ma'am. And also, we would like to thank the pillars for this webinar series. First and foremost, to our Division Superintendent, Dr. Romeo A. Alip. To our OIC Assistant Superintendent, Sir William Faltalurin. And so with all the technical team of this webinar series in the Division of Bataan, thank you so much. And also we would like to thank partner, our very energetic, dynamic, and so industrious PSDS in the whole province of the Division of Bataan. Yes, thank you so much to all of you for yes. making this webinar series possible. Yes, and we keep on reminding that kindly tune on on our Bataan Science channel mm -hmm. and Zoom and our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Ayan, so eto na tayo, partner. Yes. Uh, it's now time to introduce our facilitators and discussants for today's webinar series. All right, I think all the teachers are ready. Are you yes. excited? We are excited. Yes. So before we formally start our program, we would like to present to you the list of facilitators that we will, that we have this afternoon. Mm -hmm. So the first one is Miss Jem Crisostomo, teacher one from Baseco National High School. We also have Mom Jennifer A. Season, teacher one of Mariveles National High School, Cabcaben Annex, Alas Asin. And our last but not the least, we also have Sir Eduardo Antonio Jr. from the District of Orion. He is Teacher 1 from Jayag Memorial National High School. Yes, thank you so much. And please remind all participants, as we go along with our discussion, you may type 
all your questions, your queries, comments, and suggestions in our chat box. Mm -hmm. And please don't forget to register on our link. We will post it before or after this program so you could register in this webinar. Moving on to start now with our first facilitator, let us all welcome Ms. Jem Crisostomo, Teacher 1 from Baseco National High School, to share with us the topic about earthquake. Good day everyone! My name is Jem Tilumabas Crisostomo, Teacher 1 of Baseco National High School. Our today's learning objectives is number one explain how typhoon develops and how it is affected by land masses and bodies of water next trace the path of typhoons that enter the philippine area of responsibility using a map and tracking data what is the difference between a hurricane a typhoon and a cyclone absolutely nothing they are all the same the only difference between any of these storms is the location where the storm occurs and the direction they spin. If it is in the Atlantic Ocean and the Northeast Pacific, we call them hurricanes. If it is in the Northwest Pacific near Asia where Philippines is located, it is called a typhoon. If it is in the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean, it is called a cyclone. Storms in the northern hemisphere spin counterclockwise, and they spin clockwise in the southern hemisphere. A tropical cyclone is a generic term used by meteorologists to describe a rotating organized system of clouds and thunderstorms that originates over tropical or subtropical waters and has closed low-level circulation. The tropical cyclone undergoes a process of development called cyclogenesis. Most tropical cyclones occur in the area where the northeasterly and southeasterly trade winds converge. This area is called the ITCZ or the Intertropical Convergence Zone, circulating near the equator and is known for its lowest surface pressure where the converging air ascends causing low pressure on Earth's surface. Parts of the typhoon A typhoon structure is divided into four parts, the outer rain bands, inner rain bands, eye wall, and the eye. First, the eye. It is here where the lowest pressure can be found. It is also the relatively calm part of the typhoon with sometimes light winds of up to 20 km per hour blowing. The sky may be just partly cloudy by intermittent bursts of blue sky through the thin clouds. The average diameter of an eye is about 30 kilometers across. Next is the eye wall. The eye wall is an organized band of clouds immediately surrounding the center of eye of a typhoon. It is the area of most violent winds, heaviest rainfall, and greatest release of heat energy. The ring of violent winds and torrential rains is usually 8 to 40 kilometers from the storm center of eye. Typhoon force winds of greater than 118 kilometers per hour can be expected within this wall. The third one is the inner rain bands. It is defined as the inner or main spiral bands of a typhoon which are organized as it moves inward towards the center. It is characterized by moderate intermittent rains with tropical storm force winds of 63 to 117 kilometers per hour. Heavy squalls of up to 5 minutes occurring every hour can be expected and 90% of the sky is covered with high to mid-level clouds. The last one is the outer rain bands. It is defined as the outer spiral bands of a typhoon which are scattered but moving inward. It is characterized by occasional light to moderate rainfall with winds of up to 62 km per hour. Heavy squalls of up to 5 minutes occurring every 3 to 6 hours can be expected. Sunlight may still penetrate at these bands 
50% cloud cover. The life cycle of a tropical cyclone. An average life cycle of a tropical cyclone is 9 days and includes 4 stages. Formative, immature, mature, and decay. Formative stage or the incipient stage is when the tropical cyclone form in waves and in sheer lines of pre-existing disturbances and winds usually remain below the typhoon force. The next stage is the immature stage, the deepening stage of the cyclone during which it continues to deepen until the lowest central pressure and the maximum wind intensity are reached. However, intensification does not usually take place since some have been known to die down even though the winds has attained typhoon force. The third stage is the mature stage, the stage of maturity of the tropical cyclones where the areas of circulation expands while the surface pressure no longer falls and no increase in maximum wind speeds can be observed which may last for a week. And the last stage is the decaying stage. This is the dissipating stage of the tropical cyclone where the surface pressure rises and the area by the cyclones diminishes in size as it recurves or dissipates due to friction and lack of moisture. Over continents or over colder and drier air enters through when they go poleward. How do tropical cyclones form? There are a couple of ingredients that will benefit for the formation of a tropical cyclone here in the Philippine Sea and Western Pacific Ocean. These are number 1. Warm sea surface temperature of at least 26.5 degrees Celsius with a depth of 150 feet and high moisture or humidity present in the atmosphere. The heat of the sea is therefore the main energy source of a tropical cyclone. Number two, presence of the intertropical convergence zone or the ITCZ. The ITCZ plays an important role in the formation of tropical cyclones as it delivers convergence of northeasterly and southeasterly or southeasterly trade winds. Its convergence will trigger a rotation of low-level winds which then develop into tropical cyclones if other ingredients are present. The third one is the existence of the tropical disturbance, also known as the Low Pressure Area or LPAs, within the ITCZ. When the ITCZ is very active, multiple tropical disturbances occur and it aids for development of the tropical cyclones. The last one is the weak vertical wind shear or light winds in the upper atmosphere. If wind speeds in the upper atmosphere is 20 to 50,000 feet are low or less than 20 kilometers per hour, a tropical cyclone can develop rapidly usually within one to two days. There are classifications of tropical cyclones and here are the classifications. For tropical depression, the tropical depression has maximum sustained winds of up to 61 kilometers per hour, equivalent to 33 nautical miles per hour or more. The next one is the tropical storm that packs 62 to 117 kilometers per hour. Meanwhile, a severe tropical storm will only be applicable for the international warning for shipping and will not be used for general public dissemination unlike other categories. Typhoon Typhoon is used in identifying a tropical cyclone with wind speeds 118 to 220 kilometers per hour to 64 to 120 knots. Super Typhoon Super Typhoon has maximum sustained winds of more than 220 kilometers per hour and is as powerful as 120 nautical miles per hour or more. The last one is the Super Typhoon, a tropical cyclone with maximum speed exceeding 220 kilometers per hour or more than 120 knots. Habagat usually means wet conditions in the western sections of the country from June to September. Because of this, 
Habagat brings significant amount of rainfall during the rainy season that triggers flooding and landslides. Sometimes, Habagat is further enhanced by the presence of the tropical cyclones within or even outside the Philippine area of responsibility. An enhanced southwest monsoon happens when a tropical cyclone turns towards the southwest islands of Japan. This usually produces intense rainfall, causing flooding across the entire western seaboard of the Philippines. More so ever, Western Visayas, Palawan, Mindoro, and Western Luzon, including Metro Manila. Remember the flooding caused by Habagat in 2012 and 2013? Those were among the most notable enhanced southwest monsoon activities in recent history. Habagat 2012 was caused by Typhoon Haiku in southeast China, and during Habagat 2013, Tropical Storm Maring was nearly stagnant somewhere around northeast of Batanes, enhancing the southwest monsoon. As you can see, southwest monsoon and tropical cyclones do not make for good company during the rainy season. Based on data from Pag-asa from 1951 to 2013, the months with the most number of tropical cyclones that enter the Philippine area of responsibility are July, August and September, whereas the most number of tropical cyclones that make landfall are in the months of October, November, and July. For you to further understand how typhoons develop, let's watch this. Strong winds, heavy rains, floods, storm surges, these are just some of the hazards that are brought by tropical cyclones. The formation of tropical cyclones is a natural phenomenon that is used by the Earth to attain balance or equilibrium, transferring energy from the equator to colder parts of the Earth. They are called by various names. In the Northwest Pacific, we call them typhoons. In the Indian Ocean and Southwest Pacific, they are called cyclones. And in the Atlantic, they are called hurricanes. They are often found to form within the Intertropical Convergence Zone, or the ITCZ, where the Northeast and Southeast trade winds meet. Typhoons form just like how ordinary rain clouds form. They start from the evaporation of water molecules from the ocean. Because this moist air is warm, they travel upwards until they meet with cold air. At this point, they start to condense and form clouds resulting in rain showers. The clouds dissipate and vanish after precipitation is completed. With a very active system, clouds can group together into large clusters of thunderstorms. These clusters of clouds are areas of low pressure in the atmosphere. When combined with warm ocean waters, typically over 26 degrees Celsius, they join two of the key ingredients in transforming ordinary clouds into deadly typhoons. Converging winds also help the movement of warm, moist air from the ocean upwards and contribute to the circulation of the typhoon. With an organized circulation, the low-pressure area becomes a tropical depression. As the tropical depression drifts, it may encounter areas of the ocean where it is exceptionally warm. This will further drive the increase of its circulation, transforming it into a typhoon. And when conditions are ideal, the system starts to rotate even faster and now on a clear center, the eye of the typhoon. The Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration, or the PAGASA, is a Philippine national institution dedicated to provide flood and typhoon warnings, public weather forecast and advisories, meteorological, astronomical, climatological, and other specialized information and services primarily for the protection of life and property and in support of economic productivity and sustainable development, the government agency was created on December 8, 1972 by virtue of Presidential Decree No. 78 reorganizing the Philippine Weather Bureau into Pag-asa. We have five Philippine storm warning signals. PSWS No. 1, 
Tropical cyclone winds of 30 to 60 kilometers per hour are expected within the next 36 hours. The impact can be no to damage to very light damage. PSWS number 2, tropical cyclone winds of 61 to 120 kilometers per hour are expected within the next 24 hours. The impact can be light to moderate damage. PSWS number 3, Tropical cyclone winds of 121 to 170 kilometers per hour are expected within the next 18 hours, and the impact can be moderate to heavy damage. PSWS number 4, tropical cyclone winds of 171 to 220 kilometers per hour are expected within the next 12 hours. The impact can be heavy to very heavy damage. PSWS number 5, tropical cyclone winds of more than 220 km per hour are expected within 12 hours. The impact can be very heavy to widespread damage. What does Pag-asa's heavy rainfall warning system mean and more importantly imply? Pag-asa releases color-coded yellow, orange, and red rainfall advisories, which mean there is observed rainfall volume that will likely continue for the next two hours in a certain area. The first one is the yellow rainfall advisory. It has 7.5 to 15 millimeter or heavy rain. It is observed one hour and expected to continue in the next two hours. Flooding is possible. We have to monitor the weather condition for this warning signal. For the next rainfall advisory, which is color orange, 15 to 30 millimeter or intense rain is observed in one hour and expected to continue in the next two hours. Flooding is threatening, so we should be alert for possible evacuation. The last one is the red. Red rainfall advisory is more than 30 mm rain. It is observed in one hour and expected to continue in the next two hours. Serious flooding is expected in low-lying areas and evacuation is a must. How do landforms and bodies of water affect the typhoon? Sierra Madre is the longest mountain range in the Philippines. It serves as the eastern wall of Luzon that protects its inhabitants from tropical cyclones usually coming from the Pacific Ocean. Land masses weakens the typhoons. Bodies of water act as a catalyst in the formation of a typhoon. The air in bodies of water is warm due to the vaporization of water. This warm air builds up or increases the wind speed of a typhoon. The climate map of the Philippines. There are four types of climate in the Philippines. For type 1, we have the color red. Two pronounced season, dry from November to April and wet during the rest of the year. Maximum rain period is from June to September. Type 2, the color yellow. No dry season with a very pronounced maximum rain period from December to February. There is not a single dry month. Minimum monthly rainfall occurs during the period from March to May. Type 3, the color green. No very pronounced maximum rain period with a dry season lasting only from 1 to 3 months, either during the period from March to May. This type resembles type 1 since it has a short dry season. The last one is the type 4 or the color blue. Rainfall is more or less evenly distributed throughout the year. This type resembles type 2 since it has no dry season. The next one is the Philippine Area of Responsibility or the PAR or PAR. The Philippine Archipelago, which is surrounded by water, lies at the western rim of the Pacific Ocean north of the equator and about a thousand kilometers from the Asian mainland. It is bounded on the west by the South China Sea or West Philippine Sea, on the east by the Pacific Ocean, on the north by the Bashi Channel, and on the south by the Sulu and Celebes Seas. 
It refers to the designated area in the northwestern Pacific where Pag-asa is tasked to monitor tropical cyclone occurrences. The Philippine area of responsibility is bounded by the black lines joining the following points. 25 degrees north, 120 degrees east. 25 degrees north, 135 degrees east. 5 degrees north, 135 degrees east. 5 degrees north, 115 degrees east. 15 degrees north, 115 degrees east. And lastly, 21 degrees north, 120 degrees east. Now I am going to teach you how to track typhoons. Using the data in Table 1, we are going to plot the day-to-day -day location of the tropical cyclone Shana on the map showing the Philippine area of responsibility. We will mark each location with a dot and then we are going to connect the dots to track the cyclone from June 30 to July 6. watch the 10 worst typhoons to ever hit the Philippines. The 10 worst typhoons to ever hit the Philippines. Despite the frequency of typhoons passing through the Philippine area of responsibility, the effects they have on infrastructure, agriculture, and loss of life can often be impossible to get used to. Here is the list of some of the worst typhoons to ever hit the country. Typhoon Haifong. The most devastating typhoon to ever hit Philippine shores happened even before the country gained its independence from Spain. Typhoon Haifong developed over the Pacific Ocean in late September 1881, and though its exact category and strength are unknown, the impact it had on the Philippines and Vietnam was devastating. Around 20,000 people died in the Philippines alone. Haifong went on to hit the port town of Haifong in Vietnam, where it decimated the town almost completely. Eventually, this typhoon ended up claiming 300,000 lives, making it the world's third deadliest tropical cyclone ever. Typhoon Heyuner Yolanda. No discussion of Philippine typhoons can go without mentioning the deadliest typhoon in modern history. Super Typhoon Yolanda had 10 minute sustained wind speeds of 230 km per hour and 1 minute sustained wind speeds of up to 315 km per hour causing widespread destruction and storm surges.
The provinces of Seymour and Leith reported the largest number of fatalities, with 5,877 alone taking place in eastern Visayas. Tropical Storm Thelma or Uring. Although not technically a typhoon, Tropical Storm Uring ranks third in the deadliest storms to ever hit the Philippines. Although its winds were far from the strongest on record, it did cause torrential rainfall in many areas of the Visayas. Much of the region received around 150 mm or 6 inches of rainfall, but late in particular had as heavy as 580.5 mm or 22.85 inches. This rainfall overwhelmed the Analao Malbasag watershed and rivers, causing widespread and devastating flooding. Typhoon Baja or Pablo. Typhoon Pablo stands out for being the strongest recorded tropical cyclone to ever hit the island of Mindanao, which is often known for its lack of extreme weather events. It made landfall as a super typhoon, with wind speeds of up to 280 km per hour. Pablo caused disruption of electricity in two provinces and triggered landslides all over the island, forcing over 170,000 people to evacuate before traveling through Palawan and eventually dissipating on December 9. Angela Typhoon Angela Typhoon also has the particular distinction of being the oldest deadliest typhoon to hit the Philippines in recorded history. Though not much is known about Angela Typhoon besides the number of fatalities caused by its arrival, its impact was large enough on Philippine history to keep the dubious honor of being the fifth deadliest typhoon to ever hit our shores. Tropical Depression Winnie While also not technically a typhoon, Tropical Depression Winnie had the disastrous power of one due to its rainfall intensity. The heavy rainfall caused by this tropical depression triggered massive floods and landslides around the Quezon and Aurora provinces, resulting in huge losses of life and ranking it one of the deadliest storms to ever hit the country. It eventually turned to a north-northwesterly track and was last located along the northwestern Luzon coast on November 30 before dissipating. Unnamed 1897 Typhoon Although Typhoon Yolanda may be the freshest in recent memory, the provinces of Samar and Leyte are no strangers to deadly weather events. An unnamed typhoon that made landfall in October 1897 tore through the island of Leyte a little over 200 years before Yolanda. Though it wasn't given a meteorological name, it caused enough extensive damage to claim the lives of approximately 1,500 people. It was recorded by the Observatorio de Manila. Typhoon Iker Nitang. Typhoon Nitang came out of a disturbed weather area near Guam before intensifying into a typhoon on August 30. It had 10 minutes sustained winds of 165 km per hour and 1 minute sustained winds of 230 km per hour, making it one of the strongest typhoons to hit the Philippines after the 1970 Pacific typhoon season. Nitang made landfall only four days after Tropical Storm June Haid hit the northern part of the Philippines and also arrived during one of the worst economic periods in the country's history. It was the worst typhoon to hit Surigao del Norte in 20 years. Typhoon Fengshan or Frank Typhoon Frank is perhaps best known for its role in the tragedy of the passenger ship MV Princess of the Stars, which capsized near Sibayan Island during the peak of the storm. Rescue attempts by the Philippine Coast Guard were impossible due to the size of the waves, and around 870 people perished. The country was poorly prepared for the impact of Frank due to errors in forecasting which predicted that Frank would track to the northwest away from the Philippines when it instead tracked west and hit full force over Luzon. Typhoon Durian or Reaming Typhoon Reaming at peak intensity had 10 minutes sustained winds of 195 km per hour and 1 minute sustained wind speeds of 250 km per hour. Its impacts were only exacerbated by the activities of Mayan volcano, which at the time had minor eruptions. Despite earlier preparations by the government, the heavy rainfall caused by reaming reaching over 457 mm or 18 inches in Albay clashed with the flows from Mayan, causing mudflows and lahar across the province. 
The torrential rain also caused dikes to break, inundating many parts of the region, and strong winds uprooted trees and houses. The history of the Philippines is peppered with storms, and their impacts feel even bigger on a small nation of smaller islands. However, while any one of these typhoons could cripple a nation, Filipinos have always picked themselves back up again. Like the bamboo growing across the archipelago, they bend in the face of strong winds, but never break. This time, typhoons can now easily be detected. The following are some specialized weather instruments and their uses. First, the pilot balloon. A balloon-like instrument filled with hydrogen gas that is released into the atmosphere to determine wind velocity and the height of clouds. The next one is the the theodolite. A movable telescope mounted within two perpendicular axes that are used to measure horizontal and vertical angles. It is used to track the path of the pilot balloon. Third one is the radio song. An instrument used to weather balloons, which is used to measure temperature, atmospheric pressure, and humidity. The fourth one is the rowing song. A radio sound that observes and determines the direction and speed of wind through a radio direction finding instrument or radar echoes. The fifth one is the weather surveillance radar. It is a sophisticated weather instrument used to detect and track typhoons at a distance of about 4,000 meters. The next one is the automatic picture transmission APT system. It is a modern electronic instrument used to provide an instant image data of local cloud cover from meteorological or weather satellites. Precautionary measures before, during, after the typhoon. What preventive measures are we going to do? First, we have to plant mangroves, build evacuation sites on higher ground, avoid constructing on no-build zones, Formulate systematic evacuation and rescue plans. What to do before a typhoon? Know your local emergency hotlines. Prepare your emergency survival kit. Monitor weather conditions. Strengthen your house and evacuate if necessary. What to do during a typhoon? Stay indoors. Stay away from floods and coastal areas. Gather family members and stay calm. Stay in the higher portion of your house, away from windows. What to do after a typhoon? Drink and eat food prepared with clean water. Thoroughly check your home. Participate in cleanup activities. Take photos of properties covered by insurance. What other preventive measures should we do to lessen the risk brought about by typhoon? First, inspect your home for needed repairs. Ready your emergency bag and first aid kit. Stockpile on clean potable water. Prepare non-perishable food. Discuss evacuation plans with family members. Ensure sufficient medicine for fever, diarrhea and maintenance medicines. Keep animals in a safe place, charge your phones and prepare batteries for a radio, and keep updated with news and follow the advice of the government. Thank you very much. This is Jem Tilumabas Crisosomo, Teacher 1 of Baseco National High School.
Well said, Ma'am Jem Chrysostomo. She made discussion, made uh, a discussion about Typhoon Partner and yes. truly very informative and captivating yung kanyang mga discussions sa ating series of webinar. And so, that's is very applicable, sir, no? Yes. Especially from the last year that we experienced, napakarami nating mga pwedeng may adapt pwedeng gamitin from the his from her discussion rather yes she made mention how to trace the pathways mm -hmm. of typhoon mm -hmm. ayan and very informative kasi nabanggit din ni ma'am jem yung mga historical events mm -hmm. ng typhoon sa buong pilipinas mm -hmm. at nabigyan din niya ng diin di ba ang pagkakaiba mm -hmm. ng typhoon cyclone and hurricane oh, no. so talagang malaman ang mga naging discussion ng ating unang facilitator partner. Mm -hmm. Speaking of typhoon, sir, ano yes. po bang typhoon ang na-experience yun? Very memorable sa inyo. Sa akin, ang typhoon rosing, mm -hmm. nabanggit man yan, yun ang memorable sa akin kasi during my elementary days, yun ay isa sa mga pinakamalakas and devastating mm -hmm. typhoon during my childhood days. Mm -hmm. Kayo naman, ma'am. Ako po is yung Bagyong Ondoy. That mm -hmm. was 2009. Oh. Na nag-fall ang Ondoy na sa Pampanga kami for board exam. Mm -hmm. Nakapila kami sa Holy Angel sa gate until nag-announce nag sila ng nag-declare sila ng postponement of our board exam. So we have to go back to Bataan during the typhoon. So very memorable ang Ondoy sa amin. Yes, and if we will trace, di ba, yung mm -hmm massive effects ng mga typhoon sa panahon natin mm -hmm. ngayon medyo nagiging nagiging ano eh uh, malala mm -hmm. kasi nga dahil na rin sa global warming and climate change phenomenon mm -hmm. kaya ultimong mga bagyo din ay nagbabago actually pati nga pangalan di ba nagbabago na rin yes. yes mga millennial names na rin ng mga ibinibigay ng mga pag, ng pag-asa mm -hmm. sa mga pangalan ng mga bagyo and once again Thank you so much, Mom Jem, for a very wonderful discussion. The Vision Webinar Series on Science Content and Teaching Strategies in the Context of the Most Essential Learning Competencies for Second Quarter. Hello, teachers. Good afternoon. I am Jennifer Adan Season, Teacher 2 from Maribel's National High School, Kapkaben Annex, Alas Asin. Before I proceed with my topic, let me read first our learning objectives for today's discussion. At the end of the session, the participant should be able of an earthquake from its focus. Letter B, intensity of an earthquake from its magnitude. And letter C, active and inactive faults. Second, Explain how earthquake waves provide information about the interior of the earth. Make you frown. 
go sideways up and down P waves travel faster than the speed of sound Surface waves act like ripples on the surface And surface waves do most of the damage And rip apart your town An earthquake is gonna rock your world An earthquake is gonna rock your world We use a seismograph To measure the quake it tells us how intense those earthquakes are And it tells us how long they take It draws the results On a seismogram We give it a score on the Richter scale You better hope that it's not 10 It's an The song Rock Your World teachers like their earthquakes did to us. To become more interesting and informative our lesson, let us motivate our students by encouraging them to join you. Like what we did today, teachers. I prepared the song with trivia in order for us to learn and enjoy the lesson. This will help us or the students to engage, understand, and love our subject. You did a great job, teachers! Earthquakes and Faults An earthquake is a sudden movement of the Earth's crust. It can be slight or violent shaking of the ground. It can be due to volcanic activity or the movement of tectonic plates, which are the pieces of the Earth's crust. The Earth's crust is covered with a thick layer of solid rocks. These rocks were once molten deep within the Earth due to high pressure and intense temperature. A crack may occur across the solid rocks, causing a fault. A fault is a planar fracture between two rocks facing each other. The movements of the rocks can be sudden or slow and continuous. They can deform the Earth's surface. Faults range from a micrometer to thousands of kilometers long and almost 10 kilometers deep. Not all faults intersect the surface of the Earth. A fault plane is a flat surface where slipping occurs. This may be vertical or sloping. A hanging wall is a block located above a fault plane, which rests on the foot wall of a fault. A foot wall, on the other hand, is a block located below a fault plane. A fault line is a surface of a fault fracture along which the rocks have been displaced. A fault scrub looks like a step on the Earth's surface, which is caused by a slip on the fault. A fault zone is the area of complex deformation associated with the fault plane. Plate boundaries are fault zones that accommodate the motion between plates. They are most often narrow but may sometimes be as wide as 1,000 to 2,000 kilometers in continental lithosphere. The three basic types of faults. The first is normal fault. It moves vertically and associated with diverging plates. It is caused by tensional stress. Tension weakens and fractures the Earth's crust, causing the other block to move downward relative to the other. Usually, there is no faulting. This is the second type of fault, which is the reverse fault. And what kind of stress causes it? The animation shows that as the hanging wall moves up with respect to the foot wall, it leads to the formation of a reverse fault. You can also see that as the stress is released from the red point called focus, waves propagate to the Earth's surface, resulting in an earthquake. A low-angle reverse fault is called a thrust fault. Strike slip faults have different type of movement than normal and reverse faults. In these faults, the fault plane is usually vertical, so there is no hanging wall or foot wall. The forces creating these faults are lateral or horizontal, carrying the sides past each other. As you can see in the animation that as the sides slip past each other, they result in an earthquake. 
the slip occurs along the strike, not up, or down the dip. Where tectonic plates move at a constant rate, most faults do not. When a fault does move slowly without rupture, it is said to creep. Evidence of creep can sometimes be seen in slightly displaced buildings or are jogged to the left or right on a sidewalk. Most faults do not slip much at all most of the time and when they do slip, they cause earthquakes. A typical fault with a slip rate of 2 mm per year might have one earthquake approximately every 100 years that creates about 0.2 meters of displacement in a matter of seconds. Hypocenter versus Epicenter The epicenter is the point on Earth's surface directly above where an earthquake occurs along a fault. The hypocenter is the actual point at which the earthquake occurs along a fault beneath Earth's surface. They both represent the origin point for seismic waves, but the epicenter is on Earth's surface and is used to measure the two-dimensional spread of seismic waves, whereas the hypocenter is used to measure the three-dimensional spread of seismic waves and is the actual source of the seismic waves. Furthermore, surface waves will also spread out from the epicenter, whereas only body waves are initially associated with the hypocenter of an earthquake. Active faults and inactive faults. Active faults, areas along which all shallow earthquakes occur, display seismic activity within 10,000 years. Inactive faults, areas which had not displayed any seismic activity for more than 10,000 years. So let us find out the fault lines here in the Philippines. In Central Philippine Fault, the Masbate, Eastern Leyte, Southern Leyte, Agusan del Norte, Agusan del Sur, and Davao del Norte. Marikina Valley Fault, the affected area, Muntinlupa, San Pedro, Pinan, Carmona, Santa Rosa, Calamba, Tagaytay, and Oriental Mindoro. Western Philippine Fault, Luzon Sea, Mindoro Street, Panay Gulf, and Sulu Sea are the affected areas. Eastern Philippine Fault, the affected area is Philippine Sea. Southern of Mindanao Fault, the affected areas are Moro Gulf and Celebes Sea. Instruments used to measure earthquakes Seismographs are instruments used to measure earthquake waves. A seismogram is the record they produce of the arrival times and magnitude of earthquake electronically and can detect even very weak or very distant signals. Seismographs enable us to measure the size of earthquakes and to locate them accurately. Richard Scale and Mercalli Scale Earthquake Charles F. Richer, an American seismologist and physicist, devised an instrument to measure the magnitude of an earthquake. This instrument is known as the Richer Scale. It is based on the amplitude of seismic waves. The stronger the earthquake, the stronger the seismic vibration it causes. The intensity of an earthquake is the strength of seismic shaking in a given area or location. An earthquake has a single magnitude but can have a different intensities in different areas. Areas near the epicenter have higher intensity. Areas from far the epicenter have weaker intensities. Specific numbers are assigned to represent different levels of shaking. These numbers are used in studying the pattern of earthquakes that occur in different areas. This study led to the development of the Mercari scale by just his scale was modified in 1930. Look at this picture. The first picture is the intensity one. The effect is instrumental. It is detected only by seismograph and the magnitude is 1 to 2. The second picture is intensity 2, the effect is feeble, noticed only by sensitive people, and the magnitude is 2 to 3. The next picture is intensity 3, the effect is slight, resembling vibration caused by heavy traffic, and the magnitude is 3 to 4. And first picture, that is the intensity 4, the effect is moderate, felt by people, freestanding objects are disturbed. The magnitude is 4. Second picture is the intensity 5. The effect is rather strong. Sleeping people wake up and the magnitude is 4 to 5. 
Last picture is the intensity 6. The effect is strong. Swaying of trees, objects overturn and fall. The magnitude is 5 to 6. The first picture is the intensity 7. The effect is very strong. General alarm. Wall crack. Magnitude 6. The second picture is the intensity 8. It is destructive. Chimneys fall. Some other buildings are damaged. The magnitude is 6 to 7. Intensity 9. For the third picture, the effect is ruinous. Ground begins to crack. Houses begin to collapse. Pipes break. And the magnitude is 7. Intensity 10. For the first picture, the effect is disastrous. Many buildings are destroyed. Landslide occur. The magnitude is 7 to 8. For the second picture is the intensity 11. It is very disastrous. Few buildings remain standing. Bridges and rail wheels are destroyed. It is magnitude 8. And the last picture is the intensity 12. The effect is catastrophic. Total destruction. Objects are thrown into the air. Grounds are distorted. And the magnitude is 8 or greater. Let us define first what is seismic waves. Seismic waves are waves of energy that travels through the earth. There are three types of seismic waves. They are primary waves or the P waves, secondary waves or the S waves, and the secondary waves. Primary or P waves. These waves can travel through fluids and solids and are longitudinal. This means they transfer their energy through compression like a slinky forming compressed areas when you push one end. This also means that they transfer energy parallel to the direction of the wave. So if a wave is traveling north to south, the energy will be transferred in this direction. P waves are the fastest of the three seismic waves. Secondary or S waves. S waves cannot travel through air or water, only through solids, but they have a larger amplitude this is the height of a wave measured from the highest point to the middle line, so are more destructive in the case of an earthquake. They are transverse waves, meaning they transfer energy perpendicular to the direction of the wave like a rope being shaken up and down. S waves are slower than P waves. Surface waves has two types, the Rayleigh wave and the Lock wave. The final type of seismic waves occur along the boundary between two different substances. They can be either longitudinal or the Rayleigh, or transverse, or love and Rayleigh. Those waves travel slower than both S and P waves but have a higher amplitude and so can be the most destructive of all the seismic waves. All three types of seismic waves are generated in an earthquake and we can monitor them to find out about the nature of one. For example, by measuring the difference in arrival at monitor between the fast P waves and slower S waves to find the location of earthquake's focus. The seismic waves called P waves pass through the core and are detected on the far side of the earth. Indirect signals received in the P wave shadow zone suggest there is a solid inner core deflecting some waves. The seismic waves called S waves do not travel through liquid. We know that the outer core is liquid because of the shadow it casts in S waves. Knowing how the waves behave as they move through different materials enable us to learn about the layers that make up the earth. Seismic waves tell us that the earth's interior consists of a series of concentric shell with a thin outer crust, mantle, liquid outer core, and a solid inner core. This time, I'm going to discuss the 10 strongest earthquakes in the Philippines that cause major destruction and casualties. We all know that the Philippines is located along the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is the reason why our country is prone to seismic and volcanic activity. Number 1. Magnitude 8.0 Earthquake in Mindanao A magnitude 8.0 earthquake took place near Mindanao in Sulu a little past midnight of August 17, 1976 that was felt as far as Visayas. It was then followed by a massive 4 to 5 meters high tsunami covering 700 kilometers of coastline bordering the island. 
because it was dark that people were caught by deranging 1,000 lives, injuring 10,000, and leaving 90,000 more homeless. Number 2. Magnitude 7.8 Earthquake in Northern and Central Luzon a total of 2,412 people died and at least 10 billion pesos worth of damages to public and private properties was reported after a magnitude 7.8 earthquake struck northern and central Luzon at around 4 o'clock in the afternoon of July 16, 1990. Yet Teresa's Plaza, Nevada Hotel, Baguio Hilltop Hotel, Baguio Park Hotel, and FRB Hotel all in baggy collapse trapping and burying people alive. Although the epicenter was recorded in Nueva Ecija, it caused more damage in the city of the Pines. And the quake that just lasted for about a minute was one of the tragedies in the country that would never be forgotten. Number 3. Magnitude 7.5 Earthquake in Luzon the magnitude 7.5 earthquake that crushed the sun on November 30, 1645 at about 8 o'clock in the afternoon was called the most terrible earthquake in Philippine history. The epicenter of the said quake was in Nueva Ecija caused by the San Manuel and Cabaldon Falls. The extent of the tremor was felt as far as Cagayan Valley. It has caused many landslides which buried many people alive and destroyed many buildings and churches including Manila Cathedral. That time, only Spanish are counted so the recorded number of casualties was only 600 while the injured was 3,000. Number 4. Magnitude 7.3 Earthquake in Casiguran Most of the people in Casiguran Aurora was still fast asleep when a magnitude 7.3 earthquake struck at 4.19 in the morning of August 2, 1968. It was another deadly and shocking seismic activity in the country and the city of the Manila got the most severe damage. Many buildings were either damaged or destroyed totally. The said event was also called the Ruby Tower Earthquake after the said six-story building located in Binondo collapsed and caused the death of 260 people. A total of 268 people died that day and 261 more were injured. Number 5. Magnitude 7.2 Earthquake in Bohol The quake affected most of Central Visayas, particularly Bohol and Cebu. It was felt in the whole area of Visayas and reached as far as Masbati Island in the north and Cotabato in southern Mindanao. According to the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, a total of 222 people died, 8 went missing, and 976 others were injured. An estimated 73,000 structures were damaged, wherein more than 14,500 of which were destroyed totally. Number 6. Magnitude 7.1 Earthquake in Mindoro November 15, 1994, at around 3.15 in the morning, a magnitude 7.1 earthquake rocked Mindoro. A gigantic 8.5-meter tsunami then followed which devastated the islands of Baco and Calapan, Mindoro. A total of 7,566 houses were washed out and some 78 people died because of that tragedy. Number 7. Magnitude 6.9 Earthquake in Central Visayas A total of 51 people died, 62 still missing, and 112 were injured when a 6.9 earthquake Central Visayas, particularly Negros and parts of Mindanao on February 6, 2012. It caused a landslide which buried a barangay, damaged 15,483 houses, and a total damage of 383 billion pesos. Number 8. Magnitude 7.5 Earthquake in Central and Southern Mindanao A magnitude of 7.5 earthquake resulted to the death of 15 people and injuring around 100 more in Central and Southern Mindanao on March 5, 2002. The said quake originated near the Cotabato Trench that was followed by a tsunami, but it was the flood that was generated by landslides and falling debris that caused damage to an estimated 800 buildings. Number 9. Magnitude 6.5 Quake in Ilocos Norte 
The magnitude 6.5 quake in Ilocos Norte on August 17, 1983 happened around 8.18 in the evening and resulted to 16 casualties and 47 people got injured. It caused damages on various establishments such as schools, buildings, malls, residences, and etc. There were also landslides and sand boils that followed the event. Number 10. Magnitude 7.6 Earthquake Happened Near Key and Eastern Samar A very strong earthquake with a magnitude of 7.6 happened near Key and Eastern Samar on August 31, 2012 that was felt as far as Mindanao. The Philippine Institute of Volcanology and Seismology, or FIVOX, issued a tsunami warning level 3 but it was lifted 5 hours later. The quake caused damage on homes, bridges, and other infrastructure. There were also power interruptions in the affected areas, but despite the intensity, only one person was reported dead and one injured because of the landslide in Cagayan de Oro City. The following are safety measures that can be observed when there is an earthquake. Before, know the hazards in your area. Familiarize yourself with the followings like fire extinguishers, medical kit, exit routes, and evacuation plan. Check your house and have it prepared if necessary. Store harmful chemicals and flammable materials properly. Secure heavy furniture and hanging objects. Prepare your family's go bag containing items needed for survival. And last, Participate in office and community earthquake trails. During, when inside the building, stay calm and do the duck cover and hold. Duck under strong table and hold on to it. Stay alert for potential threats. Stay away from glass windows, shelves, and heavy objects. After the shaking stops, exit the building and go to the designated evacuation area. When you are outside, move to an open area. Stay away from buildings, trees, electric posts, and landslide-prone areas. If you are in moving vehicle, stop and exit the vehicle. After, stay alert for aftershocks. Assess yourself and address for injuries. Provide first aid if necessary. Prioritize the needs of older persons, pregnant women, PWDs, and children. If in a coastal area and there is a threat of a tsunami, evacuate to higher ground immediately. Check your spills of toxic and flammable chemicals. Stay out of the building until advised that it is safe to return. Check your damages in water and electrical lines and gas or LPG leaks. Here are the references for my discussion. Thank you! Thank you, Mom Jennifer, for that very informative discussion. Yes, thank you so much for a very wonderful and a live discussion. Truly, yung lang PowerPoint presentation ni Ma'am, partner, di ba? Yes. Captivating na. Mm -hmm. And, ikaw, partner, is, uh, talking about her topic, mm -hmm. kailan mo huling naranasan ang magkalindol sa Pinas? Parang this New Year lang, sir, di po ba? Oh, New Year? New Year, Christmas. Oh, Chris I guess Christmas oh, Day. Oh, Christmas. Yes. 7.30, I guess, no? Uh -oh. Lumindol ng malakas sa ating mm -hmm. lugar. Ayan. Pero, sir, parang nagamit pa rin natin doon yung duck cover and hold. Eh, exactly. Diba? Yan. Tama yung mga naging discussion ni Ma'am Season. Kasi muli, no, binigyan tayo ng kaalaman kung paano may iwasan mm -hmm. ang dreadful effects ng typhoon. Mm -hmm. At madalas naman natin itong ginagawa, di ba, sa ating eskwelahan. Mm -hmm yung tinatawag nating earthquake drill mm -hmm. sa tulong na rin ng LGU natin at saka ng fire station department. Ayan. And at the same time, sir, di po ba mas nagamit natin yung presence of mind yes. during the earthquake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So, maganda po ang mga naging discussion ng ating second facilitator kasi naibigay po niya sa atin yung mga tamang detalye hmm. ng mga konsepto na may kinalaman sa earthquake. One of the topics in the most essential learning competencies. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you so much, Ma'am Jennifer Adaon of Mariveles National High School, Kabkaben Annex, Alas Asin. Thank you. And now, let us welcome our third facilitator. He is from Jayag Memorial National High School, a teacher one, who will share to us about the strategies and techniques in teaching Science 8. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome Sir Eduardo Antonio Jr. Let's give him a virtual clap. Good afternoon, teachers. Welcome to the Vision Webinar Series on Science Content and Teaching Strategies in the Context of Milk for the second quarter. I am Eduardo A. Antonio Jr., Teacher 1 from Justice Emilio Angeles Gangkaiko Memorial High School, and I'm here to share teaching strategies in the new normal. Teachers, are you ready? So here is the outline of my discussion. First, I will define teaching strategies to be followed by teaching strategies in the new normal. And last, I will teach you how to make a test or quiz using Google Forms. During the COVID-19 epidemic, all aspects of human life were actually disrupted, including education. Because of this condition, we as teachers must have many effective teaching innovations and at least not change the purpose of the subject. Now first, let us now answer the question, what is teaching strategy? Teaching strategies, also known as instructional strategies. These are methods that teachers use to deliver course material in ways that keep students engaged in practicing different skill sets. A teacher may select different teaching strategies according to unit topic, grade level, class size, and classroom resources. So always remember that teaching strategies should be carefully matched to the teaching objectives of a particular lesson. Now, during our college days, we learned so many types of teaching strategies. And some of these strategies are case method, big group or small group discussion, peer mentoring, role-playing, visualization, inquiry-based instruction, differentiation, behavioral management, active learning, cooperative learning, integrating technology, and of course, distance learning. And I know marami pa kayong po pwedeng i-identify or enumerate the types of teaching strategies. Now, during normal, a new normal or during our pandemic time, there are common strategies that we use. And one of these, yung tinatawag natin na distance learning. Distance learning is actually not, is not a new concept. We all have experienced learning outside of a structured classroom setting through television, correspondence courses, and others. Distance learning may be implemented through the following delivery modalities. We have this modular distance learning that includes two. The first one is the digital modular distance learning or the DMDL and printed modular distance learning or the PMDL. We also have online distance learning or the ODL. Third is the TV video or radio-based instruction. And the fourth one is the blended distance learning or the BDL. We have this blended distance learning. It is an instructional approach that uses digital strategy in tandem with the best practices or best practice in the classroom. In some blended classroom, digital and face-to-face -face teaching may alternate according to fixed schedule. And blend traditional assessment with digital ones. Also, ma-experience nyo, nyo to sa mga susunod kung i-apply nyo yung i-discuss ko later. Kasi using technology informative and 
summative assessments uh, using uh, using Google Forms yang katulad niyan makakatulong yan para mas mapadali natin yung ating um, pagbibigay ng test sa ating mga student. So, mas nag enjoy din yung mga students natin kasi instead of paper and pen, pencil test, magkakaroon sila ng another form of assessment. No? O pwede nyo kasing laruin yung paggagawa nyo ng quiz or ng test using Google Form. So, lagi natin tatandaan, pasayahin natin ang mga sudyante. Lagi natin itatak sa isip nila that learning is fun. So, ito yung examples naman natin ng mga Uh, po pwedeng gawin kapag uh, pinili natin mag-blended distance learning. So, for biology, students writing a narrative or essay could also digitally design a front cover, okay, reflecting the themes of their story. So, doon lang naman sa mga pipili yan ng blended distance learning. Okay, sa chemistry naman, po pwedeng students doing experiments could record themselves or do simultaneously via Zoom. Do it simultaneously via Zoom. And then analyze their work or output. Pwede sila mag-exchange ng mga opinions or ideas habang sila ay naka-zoom. A standard oral presentation in earth science could be recorded as a podcast or video with engaging multimedia elements. O kamukha ng mga ginawa natin nung nakaraan, di ba nagkaroon tayo ng vlog? Okay, pa-contest pa nga yon para sa ating uh, science fair. And then, The last one for physics, okay, students could test their skills against peers via FET or P-H-E-T interactive simulation. So, senior yan ni um, Dr. Bermilio, pinakita doon meron tayong mga ikiklik na ano siya, simulation pero virtual. Maganda siya. O pwede niyo siyang itry. Yun lang yung um, ikahanapin niyo yung P-H-E-T. Search niya sa Google or sa... Yeah, Google. Okay, let's now move on to the last part of my discussion, which is about Google Forms. Okay, so here we're going to make use of technology in administering tests. Kasi gagawa tayo ng formative test or ng summative test. So, depende sa inyo kung ano yung gusto nyong gawin. Let me ask you this. What is the first thing that comes into your mind when... you hear the word Google Forms or after seeing the words Google Forms. For me, pagka nakita or narinig ko yan, ang papasok agad sa isip ko ay, it's free. Something that is free. It is online. It is a tool. But what kind of tool? Tool that can be, I used to get a survey, a test, receive a feedback, evaluation, registration, attendance, and quiz. So, yung registration, attendance, and evaluation na experience natin yan, madalas pag umaatin tayo ng webinar, right? Okay, so, gamit ang inyong laptop or desktop, turn it on, and then launch your browser. So, pagka-launch nyo ng browser nyo, meron kayo makikita on the left side that is Microsoft Edge. And then on the middle, meron tayong um, Google Chrome. Tapos yung nasa right side, Mozilla Firefox. So, ang piliin natin ay si Google Chrome. Click natin siya. And then, that will bring you to this page. Mapapansin nyo, meron tayong rectangular na kulay yellow dyan dalawa. Yan. Type nyo lang dyan si Google Forms. Okay, kung hindi naman dyan, doon sa taas. Type si Google Forms and then click Enter. And then, it will bring you to the next page wherein you would be able to read or see Google Forms free online service for personal use. Click nyo lang siya. Tapos, magiging ganito yung itsura ng Go to Google Forms. Okay, after clicking that, the Google will be asking you to choose an account. So, syempre, ang pipiliin natin yung ating DepEd email account. So, click mo siya. And then, Ihingan ka ni Google ng password. So, si Tweet na tama yung password na itatype mo para hindi ka na magkaroon ng problem. And then, click Next. After that, you will be in this page. So, ito na yung makikita nyo sa inyong monitor. Ibig sabihin, pwede ka na mag-start. Okay, so meron naman tayong other ways 
on how to get into this page. So, halimbawa, nandun tayo sa Google Homepage, on your upper right corner, nakikita mo yung picture mo doon, okay, na meron katabing nine small boxes. Click mo lang yon. Hindi yung picture mo ha, yung nine small boxes. Uh, click that. And then, pag kinlik mo siya, yan yan, hanapin mo lang si Forms. Okay, and then pagka-click mo kay form, ito na yung makikita nyo. Now, look at your screen. On the left side, mayroong cross. Cross na mayroong different colors. Ayun siya. Click mo yan. Then, right after clicking, dadaling ka rin dito sa page na to. Ready ka na ulit gumawa. Okay? Next, titigan mabuti yung screen. Nakikita nyo si titled form. Okay, ayan. Tapos sa ilalim ni titled form, meron nakalagay form description. Okay, so dyan tayo maglalagay kung ano yung gusto mong gawing title at saka ano yung description ng title na yon. So for me, okay, um, napili ko dyan, yan. So meron tayong first summative test in science, yan yung itinipe ko na title. And then ang aking description ay this is test number one in science 8.0. Quarter 2, Module 1. Okay, so nakagawa na tayo ng title, nakagawa na tayo ng description ng ating summative test. Ano ngayon ang pupwede nating isunod? So, syempre, tingin lang kayo ulit ng diretso sa inyong monitor. Okay, sa upper left, makakakita kayo ulit. Yan yung file name. Okay, pagka kinlik niyo yan, ang nangyayari, pag kinlik natin si Untitled Form, okay, yung ginawa nating title kanina na First Summative Test in Science, okay, iyan din yung nagiging titled ng ating um, file. Okay, so, ayan, napansin nyo, First Sum, um, putol lang siya kasi um, kinrap ko lang para mag-gasha dyan sa ating picture. Okay, so, actually, ang nakalagay din dyan is First Summative Test in Science. Okay, doon sa uh, bandang right side naman, merong parang gear na drawing. Okay, kinlong ko siya sa yellow box para mas madali nyo makita. Iyan yung settings. Okay, so navigate natin. Tingnan natin anong makikita natin pag kinlik natin si settings. Iyan yung lalabas. So, meron tayong three kinds of settings. Meron tayong general settings, meron tayong presentation settings, and meron tayong quizzes settings. So, focus lang muna tayo sa general setting. Ano-ano ba yung mga makikita? May mga boxes. So, ibig sabihin, pipili tayo dyan, i-check natin yung gusto nating mangyari. Okay, so sa general setting, nakita natin si collect email address. So, syempre, gusto natin kilala natin kung sino yung mga um, respondents natin. So, hihinga natin sila ng email. And then, makaka-receive din naman sila ng response receipt kapag ka sila ay nakapag-submit na ng kanilang sagot. Okay? So, pag check natin yan, under response receipt, meron ka ulit pagpipilian. If respondent request it or always. So, ikaw na teacher, bahala ka mag-decide kung anong gusto mong gawin dyan. So, sa akin, kung gusto lang naman ng estudyante ko na makareceive siya ng Um, response receipts o di ikiklik ko yun pero kung gusto ko naman always siyang makareceive nun ang ikiklik ko ay si always and then doon sa ilalim nila mayroong nakalagay require sign in so ang pinipili ko dyan since summative test or formative test ang ang sasagutan nila limit to one response now kung medyo mabait-bait ka pwede mo siyang gawing dalawang beses or tatlong beses then Piliin mo na lang kung alin doon yung pinakamataas. Yun ang i-record mo. Yun lang, marami kang nakikitang number of responses. More than pa sa number ng students mo sa section na yan. Kasi kung pauulit-ulitin mo silang mag-exam. Okay? Next. Move on tayo. Punta tayo sa susunod na part, which is the presentation Uh, presentation settings. So, sa pres presentation settings, meron kayong makikitang tatlo sa ilalim. 
So si Angel, si Show Progress Bar, Shop Home Question Order, tsaka si Show Link, Submit Another Response. So ano nga ba yung Show Progress Bar? So yung Show Progress Bar na yan, it indicates how many pages of questions are finished and how many are still left na hindi pa nasasagutan that needs to be completed by your student. So kung gusto mo, makita niya yun kung ilan pa yung sasagutan niyang ilang pages pa ang dapat niyang sagutan at ilang pages na ang natapos niya, check mo siya. Okay? Next, proceed tayo doon sa second. Shuffle question order. So ito naman yung um, kung gusto mo siyang i-click, ibig sabihin, ang gusto mo mangyari sa quiz mo or sa summative test mo, nagkakaroon ng rearrangement of questions in random. So, maganda naman na i-click natin siya para mag-prevent natin yung kopyahan ng mga estudyante natin. Especially kung mga cellphones yung gamit, tapos magkakasama sila. Kasi yung number one ni student A, possible number nine ni student B. Tapos, possible din naman na number four ni student C. Even yung mga choices ng mga ng mga answers na nag-shuffle yun. Okay, so maganda, di ba? Walang kopyahan. Okay, sabay-sabay man sila mag-exam, magkakaiba naman yung mga tanong na nakikita nila. Okay, next one. Show link to submit another response. So, for sure na-observe at saka na-experience nyo na yan. During those times na nagwe-webinar tayo, gamit mo si cellphone, um, mag-i-evaluate ka, magsasagot ka, mag ano ka, mag mag-register ka, para sa attendance, hihingin ka ng ganyan sa dulo pag natapos mo na siya. Submit another response. So, kung meron kang kasamahan na mag a attendance din or mag-register ulit, yun lang ay kick-click mo. So, kung gusto mo na ganun, kasi baka meron kang students na magkakamag-anak, magpinsan, magkapatid, di ba? Tapos isang gadget lang ang ginagamit nila, pwede naman yan. And then, baka ka-receive naman sila ng your response has been recorded. Okay, next. Punta tayo sa quiz settings. Okay, so since quiz, in, uh, formative or summative test ang ginagawa natin, syempre, make this a quiz ang gagawin natin dyan. So, click lang natin siya. Turn it on para maging quiz siya. And then, doon sa ilalim, meron tayo nakita release grade. Meron tayong two choices. Okay, immediately after each submission or later after manual review. So, ako ang kiniklik ko dyan, yung immediately after each submission. So, right after i-submit ng bata yung kanyang um, output, makikita niya agad ko ilan yung kanyang score. But if you don't like it, edi doon ka sa pangalawa sa later manual review. So, if you set the, re the release grade option to later after manual review, you can click release scores on the response uh, responses tab. Tapos, to email out the grades to the student. So, marireceive na lang ng bata yung score niya sa email na ginawa niya kanina, yung doon sa bandang first part natin. Tapos, pwede ka magdagdag doon ng optional message mo. So, it's up to you na, anak, medyo sa ganitong part ka ng lesson mababa, pag-aralan mo ulit mabuti yan. So, po, pwede ka magdagdag ng gana. Na nakakatawa, medyo personal yung dating sa estudyante, no? Pero... Kung gusto mo naman immediately, nakikita ng bata yung score niya, kung ilan siya, doon tayo sa first um, choice. And then after natin doon sa release grade, meron ulit kayo makikita doon sa ilalim, yung respondent can see. Ano-ano ba yung mga gusto mong makita ng respondents or ng students mo? Merong tatlo. Meron tayong missed questions, correct answers, at saka point values. Doon sa... Missed questions, para makita mo ko, para makita ng estudyante or ng respondents, ay meron akong nalaktawan, pwede kong balikan. Pero to prevent that, pwede kasi pag gumagawa na tayo ng quiz mamaya, palagi kayong meron i-click na required, required, required. So magkakaroon ng asterisk yung portion na yon, hindi makakaproceed sa next question yung ating respondent or student unless sagutan niya muna yung nasa screen niya para maiwasan natin si miss, missed questions, okay? Now, you may also click the second one para nakikita naman ng mga bata kung ano yung correct answer. Ah, yung pala yung tamang sagot doon. Um, kaya pala mali ako yung pala yung sagot doon, no? Ganun yun. Kaya lang ako hindi ko kiniklik yan kasi pa, may mga estudyante tayo na po pwede nilang tandaan yung tanong, tandaan yung sagot, po pwede nilang maikwento yan sa friends nila or sa classmates nila na hindi pa nakakapag-exam. So, nakapag- 
nagkaroon na tayo ng, ano, ng nag-leak na yung sagot. Okay, and then the third one is point values. So, maganda rin to if you want your students or respondents to see ilan na yung um, uh, ilan yung points niya dahil sa tama ang sagot niya. So, kung pwede nagkakaroon siya ng mental calculation doon sa, oh, number one, two points para yung sag, um, sagot doon pagka tama ako. Sa number five pala, five points para yung yung magiging additional score ko kapag na itama ako yung sagot kasi nakikita naman nila yung point values. And then, doon sa right, lower, meron kayo makikita dyan na cancel or save. So, depende kung ayaw mo yung mga napili mong setting kanina, adi cancel mo. Pero kung okay ka na doon, syempre, ang kiklik natin ay si save. So, pag kinlik natin si save, automatically, okay na ang ating settings. Okay? So, ito na ulit ang makikita nyo sa inyong monitor. Meron na tayong title, meron na tayong description, and napansin nyo si email address, naka-asterisk siya. Ibig sabihin, required kasi siyang sagutan ng ating estudyante. Ayan. Okay, so, next question. Gusto kong makita, syempre, yung katabi ng ating setting uh, icon kanina, ang pipindutin mo yung mukhang mata. Yung katabi niya, yan. Kung gusto mong i-view yung ginawa mo kanina. And then, yan yung tinatawag natin na preview icon. Tapos, meron tayong palette doon sa katabi niya. Parang lagayan ng paint. Pagka ikaw ay painter, o oh, diba, or ng, uh, ikaw ay isang artist. O, oh, yan naman yung para sa themes. So, kung gusto mong baguhin yung kulay, baguhin yung font size, uh, font style, okay, lagyan mo pa ng mga ibang design yung iyong summative test. Maganda yan. Pwede mong gamitin. And then for additional applications, ito naman parang puzzle piece. Yan ang tinatawag natin na add-ons. Okay, so mamaya makikita nyo pa kung ano yung mga functions ng mga yan. Okay, so balik tayo dito sa ating ginagawang summative test. So nakatapos na tayo sa title. Meron na tayong um, description. And then under the description na andyan na yung inyong email address. Ano yung susunod mong kailangan sa student mo na mag-e-exam? Diba? So, syempre, dito natin yun ilalagay sa untitled question. So, what you will do now is to click that. Pag kinlik mo siya, ito yung makikita mo sa screen. So, syempre, dun tayo sa question. Ano nga yung susunod mong hahanapin sa estudyante or sa responded? Syempre, yung kanilang name. So, ako ang ginawa ko, last name, followed by first name, and then middle initial. Okay, so, ayan na yun. Ita-type na ng bata dyan yung kanyang name. Okay, doon sa right lower part, meron kayong nakikita tatlong dots. Okay, so ikiklik mo lang yan para lumabas yung description. So yung description, nasaan ba yan? Pansinin mo ulit doon sa names, na, sa last name na ginawa natin, nasa ilalim ng may description ulit. Ayan, di ba? Okay, so ano ngayon ang gusto mong ilagay dyan? So ako ang ginagawa ko dyan yung dis uh, direction. Okay, so yung direction, ang gusto ko ay use capital letters only. Use capital letters only. Okay, so para alam ng bata na ah, kailangan pala capital letters lahat ng pagtatype ko. Okay. So, pagka hindi ako nag-capital letter, merong mamamali sa ginagawa ko. Kaya, dapat kausapin mabuti yung mga estudyante na dapat they should follow instruction. And then, siguraduhin nyo na siya ay nasa short answer. Kasi pag short answer, para siyang identification type. So, itatype ng bata ang gusto niyang ilagay dyan. Okay? Tapos, ito na yung sinasabi natin ng required. Okay? Ayan, tingnan mabuti. Yung nasa ilalim right side yung merong arrow, ito turn on ni siya by clicking it, ayan, required na siya. So, walang magagawa ang bata. Hindi siya makakapunta sa next question unless itype niya ang kanyang pangalan. Okay po. Now, proceed tayo. Sa right side, meron kayo nakita. Positive sign. Okay. So, ano ba yan? Okay. Pag kinlik niya siya, ito na ngayon ang mapupunta or makikita nyo sa inyong screen. Whoops! Anong napansin? Natapos tayo doon sa last name, first name, middle initial na merong direction na use capital letters. 
nagkaroon ng another okay, box na may question ulit. No, sa estudyante natin na nag exam ano nga ba ang hahanapin pa natin? Nakuha na natin yung email ad, nakuha na natin yung kanyang name, syempre yung kasunod, okay, dito natin ilalagay sa question box. And syempre, yun ay ang section. So, i-type nyo lang dyan yung section. Okay, pagka-type ng section, mapapansin nyo, sa right side, merong multiple choice. So, papaano nga ba masasagutan ng bata yung section? Ita-type niya ba or pipili siya sa mga sections na okay, na andoon na sa choices. So, pag kinlik natin si multiple choice, ito yung makikita nyo. Ibig sabihin, meron kayong Um, liberty to choose. Ano ba ang klase ng pagsusulat ng section or pagpili ng section ang dapat gawin or gusto kong gawin ng aking respondent? So, pupwede siyang short answered, pupwede siyang multiple choice, or pupwede siyang drop down. So, pipili ka lang. So, halimbawa, multiple choice ang pinili mo, makakakita ka ng ganito sa ilalim ng word na section. Merong option. So, ito type mo lang dyan sa option na yan, yung section na mga puting uturuan mo. Tapos, okay, type mo lang siya dyan. Pagka-type mo dyan, let's say, ayan na lahat ng mga sections na tinuturuan mo. Eh, sir, paano naman ako makakapagdagdag? Ito yun, no? meron kang makikita laging add option. So, hanggat nag-add option ka, magkakaroon ng space for you to type in kung ano yung mga gusto mong idagdag na sections. Okay po tayo? Okay, next. Punta po tayo sa required ulit para mapilitan si estudyante na sagutin niyan. Para pagkatapos niya, nasubmit niya, kilala mo kasi may pangalan at alam mo kung anong section yung bata na yan. Okay, next. Kung drop down naman ang pipiliin mo, okay, ibig sabihin sa drop down, tinipe mo na rin lahat ng mga sections na hawak mo. Okay, so ganito naman ang magiging itsura nun kapag katapos mo siyang gawin. Merong nakasulat na section, tapos merong nakalagay choose, at tapos arrow down. Kiklik lang ng bata yung arrow down, and then lalabas na dyan lahat ng choices ng section, tapos pipili na lang siya kung anong section siya. Ganun po yung sa drop down. Okay, next. Pindutin ulit natin si required para mapilitan ng estudyante na sagutan yung portion na yan. Okay, so let's move on. Ayan. Nadagdagan po, napansin niyo po sa right side, yung equal sign na ikunulong ko ulit sa yellow box. So, para saan yan? Kasi tapos na po ako, meron na po akong um, email address ng bata, meron na po akong complete name ng bata, nakuha ko na rin yung section niya. So, I am now ready to type in the questions na sasagutan ng bata. So, para mangyari yun, kinakailangan natin mag-add ng section. So, ibig sabihin, ihihiwalay na yung portion na una nating ginawa. Okay, so pagka-click natin doon, ito na yung makikita natin. Section title. So sa section title, ano ba ang gusto mong ilagay? Ano rin ang gusto mong ilagay doon sa description? Okay, ako ang ginagawa ko dyan, ayan. Ginawa ko siyang part 1. Kung may part 1, part 2, part 3, bahala kayo. Kada part, pwede kayong magdagdag ng section. Okay, so para sa akin, ang gusto ko, part 1, tapos multiple choice or multiple choices. And then, ang lagay ko sa description, I choose the correct answer. Okay, so paano yan? Pagkatapos niyan, okay, may makikita kayo ulit, question. Okay, so ibig sabihin, pwede ka na mag-type ng first question mo doon. Okay, so pag kinlik mo si question, eto na ngayon ang susunod na makikita mo. Pag kinlik mo si question, o pwede mo nang i-type si question or punta ka doon sa right side ni question na nando doon si multiple choice. Ayan yung lalabas. Short answer. Ibig sabihin yan, baka parang identification type ang gusto mong mangyari. Or po pwede rin namang paragraph. Or po pwede rin namang multiple choice. Pwede rin check boxes. Or drop down. Or file upload. So, ibig sabihin, yun yung different types of questions and answers na po pwede mong ipagawa sa bata, pipili ka lang dyan. Okay, so, 
let's say, ang pinili natin una ay short answer. So, pag short answer, ito yung example natin, ha? Naka-short answer tayo. And then, ito yung tanong. It is the origin of an earthquake found below the epicenter. So, dahil short question yan, para siyang identification type. Okay, so i-require natin siya ulit, ha? Yung nasa right lower part para mapilitan ang estudyante na sagutin yan at hindi siya makakaproceed sa next question without answering this one. Okay, let's say ayaw mo yan. Gusto mo na siyang tanggalin o di i-click mo lang to para ma-delete. Or, ah, kailangan ko pa yung question na to, i-edit ko lang ng konti para medyo makita ko kung talagang naiintindihan ng estudyante yung tanong na yan at kung talagang alam niya yung sagot. Pwede mo siyang ulitin, i-rephrase mo lang, okay, pwede mo siyang i-duplicate. Pero kung wala ka naman gusto, okay na sa iyo yung mga nauna, diretso na tayo doon sa answer key. So, click mo si answer key. Ito yung makikita mo. Okay, pag kinlik mo si answer key, it will bring you to this page. Okay, so sa nakikita natin sa screen ngayon, andyan pa rin si question. Okay, pero... Sa right side, mayroong nakalagay, points. So, ang tanong, ilang points ba ang gusto mong ibigay sa sagot or sa tanong na yan? Tapos, dito naman sa ilalim ng question, add a correct answer. Diyan mo ngayon isusulat yung tamang sagot. Okay, so for this question, pag kinlik natin siya, ayan ang magiging tamang sagot. It could be focus. Okay, nabibigyan ko lang ng one point. Or pwede rin naman siyang hypocenter. So, dalawa kasi ang possible answer. Tapos, kung meron ka pang ibang answer na sa tingin mo tama, hindi idagdag ka pa ulit hanggang sa dumami. Lahat yun tama. Pero wag mong kalimutan na i-mark all other answers incorrect. Tapos, let's say, ay ayaw ko ng focus parang mali iyan. E di i-X mo lang. Click mo si X para mawala si focus doon. Okay, kaya lang wag niyo kakalimutan ha. Doon sa mark, All other answers incorrect. Ito yan. Ang sagot ng bata, focus. Pero small letters. Considered wrong po yun. Ang sagot ng bata ay hypocenter. Pero yung first letter lang niya yung capital. The rest, small letters. Maka considered wrong na po yun. Kaya napaka-importante na yung bata sumunod sa direction natin kanina na use capital letters para maging tama siya. No, habang nire-review mo yung, yung gawa ng bata, napansin mo tama naman yung sagot niya. Kaso lang, hindi siya sumunod sa direction. Now, it's up to you kung bibigyan mo siya ng consideration. Okay. Tapos, pwede rin tayo maglagay ng add answer feedback bago tayo mag-click ng done. Ako, ang nilalagay ko kasi doon sa add answer feedback ay great job! Very good! Nice! Yung mga ganong klase ng mga feedback para ba pag kinik ng bata at tama siya, nakaka-boost, mas gusto niyang mag-exam or i-continue yung exam. Kapag ka naman mali, syempre hindi naman po pwedeng uh, masyadong masasakit yung salita. Ako lang, oops, try again, or better luck, next time, oops, sorry, wrong answer, mga ganon. And then, pag kinlik mo yung done, eto naman yung makikita natin dyan. Okay, add feedback. So, doon sa enter feedback, po pwede kang mamili para lang suportahan, bakit kaya yung tamang sagot? Bakit naging iyon yung sagot? So, pwede ka mamili. Meron tayo dyan for URL. Okay, at meron din tayo dyan for parang video that will support bakit iyon ang tamang sagot. Okay, once na naklik mo na siya, dito na tayo sa save. So, okay na yan yung first question. Okay? O let's say naman ang gusto mo sa pangalawa ay paragraph. So, click mo lang siya. Pag kinlik mo si paragraph, ito na yung makikita mo ngayon. Magta-type ka na dyan sa, sa iyong question box. Pero siguraduhin mo nakaparagraph ka ha. Example natin ng tanong, Why it is important to be aware of places prone to earthquake? Okay, required para mapilit na sumagot yung bata. Yun lang, mahihirapan tayo maglagay ng answer key. Kasi kinakailangan yung essay ng bata dyan, eksaktong-eksaktong eh, kamukha nang sayo. ba? Diba? So, yung iba, hindi, na, hindi sila gumagamit ng paragraph na ganyan. Pero kung gusto mo talaga, syempre, mas mataas yung score niyan. Hindi po pwedeng one point lang yan. So, katulad halimbawa dito sa example, ang ginamit niya ay five points. And then, click done. 
Next, pwede tayo mag-multiple choice. So, click mo lang si multiple choice. Okay, so siguro mo, ayan, nasa right side, nasa multiple choice ka na. And then, type in your question on the question box. So, example natin ay, what are the Earth's layer from the surface to the center? Tapos dito mo ipapasok yung iyong mga choices. So, tandaan ha, para magkaroon tayo ng mga different choices, diyan tayo papasok or ikiklik natin si add other or add options. Laging click yon Dagdag ng dagdag ng space. Type in ka lang ng type in ng mga choices. So, let's say ayoko ng choice 1. Tatanggalin ko yan kasi parang masyadong obvious or masyadong mali. Click mo lang si X para matanggal siya. Okay, and then click required para sagutan talaga siya ng bata and then click the answer key. Tapos lalagyan natin siya ng point. So, ayan ang example natin. Lumabas na yung ating correct answer. Tapos meron tayong one point for that. So, ganyan po ang paggawa natin ng multiple choice type of question gamit si Google Form. And then, done. Next, ang gusto mo naman halimbawa ay check box or boxes. Ito yung mga select all that apply type of questions. Click natin yan. So, ayan tayo. Nasa check boxes tayo. And then you have here the question. Example question natin ay check all the boxes that are considered wise practices during an earthquake. Then, naka-enumerate dyan yung lahat ng sagot natin. Okay, so anong gagawin ng bata dyan? Chechekan lang nila kung ano yung mga wise practices during an earthquake. So, click natin si answer key. Ayan, yun nasa left, lower, kasama si points. Tapos, ilalagay mo dyan kung ano yung mga tamang sagot. Siyempre, pagka dahil maraming tamang sagot yan, 5 points ang gusto mo dyan ilagay. Or if you want 3 points, so depende pa rin yan. Yung number of points ay nakadepende sa your teacher kung ilan ang gusto mong ilagay. So, sa akin halimbawa, 4 yung correct answers, ginawa ko siyang 5 points kasi medyo mag-a-analyze at mag-iisip talaga yung bata dyan. And then, ayan, do not forget to click again, done. Okay, next type of question is the drop down. Yung drop down, ito yung parang kanina, yung parang sa pagpili ng mga students natin ng, ng section. O, so, maglalagay ka lang din ng tanong, tapos pipili lang sila. Parang ng sagot, parang multiple choice type din siya ng question, kaya lang drop down ang tawag. Okay, next. Punta na tayo sa file upload. Pag kinlik natin si file upload, ibig sabihin... Ganito yan. Ito na, si click, ah, ito na si file upload. So, siguradong iyan ang type ng question na gusto mo mangyari. So, here sa question box, okay, dyan natin itatype yung question natin. Pero meron tayong makikita sa ilalim yung allow only specific file types. So, ito turn on natin yan. So, halimbawa, ganito. Ito yung ginawa nating tanong. Collaborate with any of your siblings, parents, cousins, or friends to make an awareness campaign. Okay, slogan, song jingle, or poster about natural calamities. Please upload your file here. Pero anong klaseng file? So, ayan yung different types of files na po pwedeng gawin ng bata. Pero pipili ka lang dyan kung anong gusto mong file na ipasa sa iyo ng um, student mo. So, halimbawa, pipiliin ko ay document, video, image, and audio. So, iyan lang ang po pwede. Mamimili lang yung bata dyan sa apat na yan. And then, I have here maximum number of files. So, syempre, isa lang ipapasa niya. Pili siya dyan. Document ba? Video ba? Image ba? Or audio? And then, meron tayong maximum file size. 10 um, megabytes. Or adjustable din naman po yan. Tapos po, again, huwag kalimutan si required Para sagutan ng bata bago siya makapunta sa next type of question. Okay. Ayan. May picture na tayo. Parang medyo naging complicated na ng konti. So, let's say, ito yung ating tanong. What is the name of this deep sleep fault? So, syempre, dapat ipakita mo yung picture. Paano magkakaroon ng picture dyan? So, meron tayong nakita din sa bandang gitna. ba? Image icon. Click mo lang yan. Pag kinlik natin siya, ito ang magiging nakaharap sa monitor niyo. Or ito yung makikita niyo sa monitor niyo. Meron tayo dyang upload. Meron tayong camera. 
okay, by URL, Photos, Google Drive, or Google Image Research. So, ako ang pinili ko si Upload. Tapos, click the Browse. Okay, so dahil upload, dadaling niya ako sa aking um, desktop. Ngayon, pipili ako dyan kung ano yung gusto kong gamitin picture. So, napili ko si Earthquake Fault Types Reverse Fault. Click ko lang siya and then open and then automatic, ma-upload na siya dito. Okay po, so lumabas na. Pwede na ngayon yung pangalanan ng estudyante natin. Since tayo po ay naka-short answer, itatype ng bata yung sagot diyan sa tanong na yan. Ano ang tawag diyan sa deep sleep fault na yan? So, syempre, lagay natin yung answer key with a point. Ayan ang correct answer. Next. Halimbawa, ganito naman. Which of the following pictures reverse is a reverse deep sleep a shows reverse deep sleep fault? So, may mga different pictures po tayo ipapakita. Pipili lang ang bata doon. Alin sa mga pictures na yon ang nagpapakita ng reverse deep sleep fault? So, papaano tayo ngayon magpapasok ng pictures sa choices? Tingnan natin mabuti yung option. Di ba? Diyan natin itatype yung sagot kung tayo po ay naka-multiple choice type of question. Pero, dahil picture ang kailangan natin, makikita nyo po doon sa kanyang right side, again, ang add image. So, ikiklik nyo lang po yun Pag-click nyo dyan, dadalhin kayo ulit dito sa Upload, Camera, okay, by URL, Photos, Google Drive, and Google Image Search. Parang yung kanina lang din, and then, click nyo lang yung Browse, tapos lalabas na po ulit dyan yung picture na gusto nyong lumabas. Okay? Okay, next po tayo. Proceed tayo dito. Tingin kayo sa inyong right side. Meron kayo nakita, nagkaroon ng rectangular box na kulay blue. Marami tayong mga icons dyan. Ayan, yung positive sign. Iyan po ay para sa add questions. So, kanina, yan yung pinagdaanan natin. Kung mag-add ka na ng question number 2, click mo lang yan. Mag-add ka na ng question number 3, ikiklik mo lang ulit siya. Okay, next we have here, import questions. So, kung gusto nyo mag-import ng questions sa sa forms, sa iba, sa iba nyo pang um summative test na nasa Google Drive, po pwede po yan. Or doon sa um, Google, po pwede rin yan. Makakapag-import kayo ng question. And then, meron tayo dito parang capital T, small t. Okay, iyan naman yung parang sa title and description. Okay, then meron tayo dito um, add image icon. Yan. And then, meron tayo dito parang play button. Actually, that is for add video. Tapos ito yung nakita natin kanina, yung equal sign. Ano nga ulit yan? Pag equal sign, ibig sabihin yan ay add section. O di ba ba natatandaan nyo kanina? Nakahiwalay po yung section ng name, email address, tsaka section. Tapos nakahiwalay yung questions. Kasi para pag shuffle natin yung questions, hindi po mapasama sa magsha-shuffle yung email add, name, and section. Yun yun, reason kung bakit kinakailangan nakahiwalay sila ng section. So, on this part, tuliin natin si import questions. Click natin. So, pag kinilik natin si import question, type nyo lang dyan. Let's say, gusto kong maghanap ng mga question sa forms or sa Google Forms. Tapos, nakita ko na yung hinahanap ko. Dito ko mag import ng question. So, syempre, iseselect ko siya. Pag kinilik ko na si select, ito na po yung susunod na makikita nyo sa inyong screen or monitor. Pwede nyo piliin si select all. Ibig sabihin, lahat ng questions na nandoon doon, pinipili mo. Or pwede ka lang pumili ng portion of it. Let's say, ang pinili ko lang si true or false. So, lahat ng true or false questions doon sa napili mong exam kanina, yun lang ang mai-import mo. So, halimbawa, si true or false lang, 16 questions yon So, siya lang yung makukuha mo. Pag kinlik mo yan, automatic po, makukuha mo na yung mga questions na nandoon doon. Okay. So, next, proceed po tayo doon sa susunod, which is add video. Let's say, gusto mong may papanuurin muna yung bata bago ka maggagawa ng tanong. Or out of that video, andoon na rin yung tanong, pipili na lang ng sagot yung bata or isusulat na lang ng bata yung sagot. Okay? So, doon tayo sa add video. So, pag kinlik natin yun, ito yung lalabas. So, po pwedeng video search. Pwede kumuha ng video galing sa YouTube. 
type mo lang dyan yung hinahanap mo. So, alimbawa, ang hinahanap ko ay plate tectonics theory. Lumabas yung mga choices, pili ka lang dyan, and then click. Okay, maseselect mo na siya. Then, after that one, kung ayaw mo naman, meron ka na URL na ready, copy-paste mo lang yun, dikit mo lang siya dyan sa space para dyan mo ipipaste yung URL. Pagka-paste mo dyan, okay, and then select. Tapos, makukuha mo na ulit yung video na kailangan mo. Okay? So, ito na. Nakagawa na tayo ng ating exam or ng summative test. Okay, dito sa portion na to, yung sa kinulong ko ulit ng yellow rectangular box, doon mo makikita yung number of points na ginawa mo. Not items po, ah. Points. Kasi po pwedeng 20 points yan, pero nasa 10 items lang kasi 2 points each ang ginawa mo. Or po pwede rin naman na 1, 2, 15, tigwa, si single point lang yung pang number 16 mo kasi ginawa mo siyang 5 points kaya naging 20 points. So, 16 items type of exam pero 20 points. Pero, on my case, 20 items tigwa 1 point kaya 20 points lang po siya. Okay, dyan mo siya makikita. Kaya, dito sa ating Google Form po pwede kang makagawa ng exam na 1, 2, 13 lang pero 20 points kasi depende sa inyo kung ilang points ang ibibigay nyo sa bawat item. And then, if you want to know kung ilan na po yung nakapagsagot na studyante, kiklik mo lang tong si response. Okay? Kiklik mo lang yan si response. Para makita mo kung ilan na yung sumagot. Pero sa case natin, dahil kagagawa pa lang naman natin, zero pa yung responses. Wala pang sumasagot. Okay? Ayan, zero pa siya. And then, after that, kompleto na siya. Okay, gusto mo pang pagandahin, punta tayo dito sa themes. Okay, pag kinilik mo yon, ito na yung makikita natin. Ay, gusto kong dagdagan ng header. Gusto kong lagyan ng image. So, click mo lang to. Pag kinilik natin yan, ito yung makikita nyo. Meron tayo mga choices ng picture sa header. Eh, ang gusto ko ito. Yan, para chemistry yung dating intelligent. O, pinili ko yan. So, click insert. Ayan na po yun. Napansin nyo yung aking header. Nalag nalagyan na po siya ng picture or ng image. Okay, let's say, ay, gusto kong baguhin yung theme color. Pili ka lang dyan sa mga kulay na yan. Ito po yun. Yung napansin nyo, may nakasulat na section 1 of 2. Yan po yung magbabago ng kulay pag sa theme color. Pero ang gusto mong baguhin ay background. Siyempre, dito ay sa background color. Okay, click mo yan para magbago yung kulay ng iyong background. And then for the font style, ito yun, pag kinlik nyo yan, merong arrow down, click mo yan, so ayan yung ladabas po yung choices ng mga font style. Pipili kayo dyan ng kung paano nyo gusto nakasulat. Okay? Yung inyong questions. So depende na po yan sa inyo. Pero sa akin, basic, okay lang yung mabilis mabasa ng mga estudyante. And then, tapos ka na, napaganda mo na yung summative test mo, Ayan po ulit tayo dyan sa parang mata. Ayan po yung ating preview icon. Click mo yan para makita mo yung itsura ng ginawa mo from top to bottom. Okay, from number one up to the last number para makita mo siya. Okay? And then, do not forget to send. Okay, so papaano mo siya isi-send? Siyempre yung URL niyan, or parang yan mismo, direkta, sasend mo siya sa um, email ng mga estudyante or po pwede mo rin siyang send sa group chat nyo, or po pwede mong i-PM sa estudyante. So, depende ka. Bahala kang mamili kung paano mo siya isi-send. O, um, sa simula, kung gusto mo, group chat, group chat muna, or PM, PM muna. Then, right after that, pag sinagutan nila, di ba, magpapasa sila ng sa kanilang mga response na naandu na yung email ad nila. And, sa susunod sa email mo na lang siya isend. So, actually, it's up to you, teacher, kung paano mas mapapadali nyo mapapasagutan yung Google exam sa mga estudyante. So, halimbawa po, ayan, nakapagsagot na si mga estudyante. After two days, inopen mo ulit yung iyong summative test. Mapapansin mo ngayon yung responses, o yung nadagdagan from zero naging 27. Ibig sabihin, meron ka ng 27 students na sumagot. Pag kinlik mo siya, ayan, meron ka makikita na andyan na yung names ng mga estudyante mo, na andyan na rin yung kanilang mga scores, kung anong araw sila sumagot, at kung anong oras. Okay? So, yun lang po yun. Ganun lang kadali ang gumawa ng Google Form Type of Quiz 
formative test or summative test. Mas maganda, madali on our part as teacher kasi less na po yung chechikan natin. Nakikita na natin agad yung kanilang score. And at the same time, yung mga studyante, nag-enjoy sila habang nagsasagot. Okay, so do not let the chaos of this pandemic ruin your love for teaching or your students' love for learning. You can find ways to be an effective, attentive teacher amidst the madness happening around the world. Teachers can help children in the age of coronavirus by being available, communicative, and by supplying an education that matters. Always remember, the happier your students are, the harder they will work in class. Okay po, kaya nga sabi nga natin, learning is fun. Okay, so ito po yung aking mga references. Pero special thanks po kay Ma'am Catherine Bernabe kasi inalaw niya ako na gamitin ang kanyang, um, ang kanyang slide. Pinayagan niya akong i-edit para po mas mapadali ang aking paggagawa ng Google Forms quiz. Okay, maraming maraming salamat po. God bless po sa ating lahat. Thank you so much, Sir Eduardo Antonio. Uh, very informative po ang inyong mga naging discussion no, sa ating webinar series na ito. Kasi yung ating first facilitator partner, di ba? Mm. She made discussion about typhoon. Mm. And the then second the second is, is all about earthquake. earthquake. So parang dalawang mabibigat na topic mm -hmm. tapos nilapatan ng kung paan strategies and techniques na naibigay sa atin ng ating third facilitator eh talagang binigyan tayo kung ng mga kaalaman partner kung paano ito may paparating ng may buong kisig no mm -hmm. yung mga techniques kung paano natin maibabahagi sa mga mag-aaral lalong-lalo na ngayong pandemya lahat ng pagkuturo ay ginagawa na lang sa modular mm -hmm. learning and online partners yes. at talaga pong applicable siya sa lahat ano po sir no napakadali niyang gawin yes. and kung hindi naman gaano ka teki si ma'am or si sir madali pa rin siyang mai-guide ng mga younger teachers and techie teachers sa kanilang school or sa bahay, di po ba? Yes. At hindi talaga tayo kayang pigilan no, mm -hmm. ng anumang kalamidad o problema mm -hmm. sa buhay. Ang guro ay patuloy na susulong mm -hmm. at hindi uurong. Mm -hmm. Ayan. So maraming Because, maraming salamat, partner, yes. sa ating tatlong facilitators. And this pandemic really teaches us to learn relearn and unlearn the skills that we need to use for this new normal yes. in education system ng ating actually buong mundo di po ba mm -hmm. so we would like to thank you to our facilitators to our teachers who are watching with us and still watching with us right now thank you so much Ayan. So, questions posted by our participants on the chat box were written by us and were, will be raised on this time or uh, point of time, partner. Ayan, uh, naisulat po namin lahat ng mga queries ng ating mga participants and so with their questions and suggestions. So, sisimulan na po natin sa... Uh, sa mga tanong na naibahagi po ng ating mga participants. To our facilitators, so this will be the mechanics of our Q&A. We'll we will be posting the questions from our participants and mm -hmm. then followed up by your answer. Yes. Pag-asa assigns familiar yet distinctive Filipino names to typhoons for an effective recall among the public, especially those in the provinces. Practically speaking, having local typhoon names also lessens confusion. Assigning an easy-to-recall name to a typhoon helps draw public attention to its disastrous effect, and it also helps in disaster risk awareness and preparedness.
Pag-aasahan, pick 140 names to make up a list for tropical cyclones. It is divided into four sets of 25 typhoon names, each starting with A to Z, and with an additional of 10 auxiliary names, each starting with A to J. Pag-asa's list is a mix of male and female names as well as gender-neutral names like Kabayan, Kinta, and Zigzag. On average, 20 typhoons hit the Philippines every year. So each of 25 typhoon names is enough for one year. In case they use all the typhoon names within the year and another storm will enter the country, Pag-asa will use the auxiliary set of names. And it also faces the Western Pacific. The Western Pacific has the warmest ocean temperature, which is normally above 28 degrees Celsius. And you need temperatures above 28 degrees Celsius, we have to face the force of typhoons before they make their landfall. Hello teachers, good afternoon. Your first question is, how does an earthquake affect people's lives? An average of 3.5 million people is affected by an earthquake. Some of the common impacts of earthquake includes damage to buildings, homes, infrastructure, highways, and bridges, resulting in the loss of life, and sometimes it triggers tsunamis, landslides, and volcanic eruption. Your second question is, why Philippines is prone to earthquake? Philippines has a high vulnerability to natural calamities like earthquake because of its location on the so-called Pacific Ring of Fire and movement of tectonic plate. Your third question is, how can earthquakes be prevented? We cannot prevent natural calamities like earthquakes from occurring, but we can significantly mitigate their effects by identifying hazards, building safer, and providing education on earthquake safety. Good afternoon po ulit sa ating mga viewers. And I'm here for the question and answer part of our webinar series. Maraming salamat po sa mga nag-phone in at nag-chat ng kanilang mga questions. For question number one, what is the best strategy to use in this time of pandemic? Now, during my discussion kanina po, na-mention ko yung four different strategies na sinasuggest po ng Department of Education sa kanilang memorandum. So, ito po yung modular distance learning, online distance learning, TV video or radio-based instruction, and the blended distance learning. So, ito po yung apat na po pwede natin pagpilian. Now, to answer what is the best strategy strategy to use. Um, ang personal answer ko po dyan, eh, based po, uh, depende po yan sa, sa situation po ng inyong mga learners and of course doon po sa topic na i-discuss or gusto nyong matutunan ng inyong mga estudyante. Now, kung pipili ako doon sa apat, ang pipiliin ko po ay yung blended because doon po sa blended, po pwede po natin ma- i-consider yung situation ng ating mga estudyante kung meron ba silang kakayanan sa online or meron ba silang internet connection sa bahay. Kung wala naman po ay magmamodular sila or baka meron silang TV or radio sa bahay kasi yung blended po ay combination of the different strategies na best na dapat po natin gamitin during pandemic time. So, ang maisasuggest ko po ay yung blended po. Okay, para po sa ating question number two, meron po bang limit yung numbers of questions sa Google Quiz? Well, in real situation po, wala naman pong limit. Pwede po kayong mag-type in ng inyong mga questions ng inyong um, quiz or ng summative test or be it periodical test pagkatapos po ng ating pandemic time. Pwede po yan kahit po ilan. 
Pero since nasa pandemic time nga po tayo, meron pong mandate ang Department of Education na hanggat maaari po ay ilimit po natin yung mga questions po natin into 15 items lang or the most na po siguro yung 20 items. Salamat po. Okay, for question number three, can we control or manage the time when should the students answer the Google quiz? Yes po, pwede po natin makontrol or ma-manage kung kailan lang po dapat magsagot ang ating mga learners. Hindi lang po napakita doon sa aking presentation pero nabanggit ko naman po yung add-ons. Okay, yung add-ons po, kahilera po siya ng themes at saka ng settings. Okay, yung pong parang puzzle icon. Click nyo lang po yun and then download nyo po yung form limiter. Once na na-download nyo na po si form limiter, click nyo lang po siya and then piliin nyo na po doon yung date and uh, time kung kailan lang po po pwedeng magsagot yung mga bata. And then kung ano po yung nilagay nyo doon, automatic po right after po ng time at saka ng date na binigay nyo doon, hindi na po mag-a-accept si Google ng responses coming from your students. Kung hindi naman po kayo nakapag-download, balikan nyo po yung um, quiz na ginawa nyo. Once na nandun na po sa inyong monitor yung quiz na ginawa nyo, tingnan nyo lang po yung bandang gitna. Meron po kayong makikita dyan na questions at saka responses. Click nyo po si responses. And then once na naklik na po si responses, sa ilalim po niyan, bandang kanan, meron po kayo doon pa makikita na bar, po pwede nyo po yung i-turn off. Once na tinurn off nyo po, hindi na po po pwedeng makapag-submit or makapagsagot yung mga estudyante. Yun lamang po, dapat alert si teacher kung kailan po siya dapat mag-turn on or mag-turn off ng mga pagsasagot po ng mga estudyante natin. And dapat din po, binigyan nyo po ng direction na maliwanag yung estudyante kung kailan po sila po pwedeng magsagot at kailan po hindi na dapat magsagot. Thank you so much to all our very smart and well-oriented facilitators. So, salamat sa mga naging sagot ninyo mula sa mga katanungan ng ating mga participants. So, may mga tanong pa mga partner, partner ng mga hindi pa na, na, nabigyan ng kasagutan, pero mabibigyan po ng tugon yan mula sa ating mga facilitators basta na-retrieve lang po sa ating Facebook page yes. at saka sa ating Bataan Science Channel ang ating uh, webinar series na ito. And to give us her closing remarks, she is the woman behind this team, Orion. Let us welcome our District Science Coordinator, a school principal one of Pablo Roman Elementary School. Let's give her a virtual clap, Mrs. Jocelyn M. Reyes. To our Schools Division Superintendent, Sir Romeo Alip. To our Assistant Schools Division Superintendent, Sir William Roderick Faliorin. To our uh, CID Chief, Madam Mila Peñaflor. To our EPS in Science, Sir Edwin Bermilio. To all the participants and to everyone who is watching right now, a pleasant day po to all of you. First of all, I would like to congratulate the program management team of uh, Grade 8 Science for a job well done. Our uh, gratitude also to Sir Edwin Bermilio, our EPS in Science, for uh, giving us the opportunity to take part in this great endeavor. Indeed, it was an honor, sir. In conclusion, let me pose this challenge to all the participants of this webinar. We have just done our part in our mission to uplift the quality of science education in our division. It's now your turn to impart yours by applying what you have learned from this webinar as you teach your students under the new normal and in whatever learning delivery modalities you use. Again, thank you very much. Good day and God bless us all.
Thank you so much to our district science coordinator and PMT leader, Ma'am Jocelyn Reyes. Thank you so much, Ma'am. Yes, thank you so much. And for those who are not yet done with our evaluation and post test, we will be posting here the link so you could um, register or try to answer those evaluation given to us. Yes, and before we end, we also would like to thank to, uh, our program management team in Orion, yes. the technical team, the program management team, the facilitators, ayan, and the our moderators. To, uh, yes, <laughs> for us moderators, thank you so much, Ma'am Jessa. And Sir Joel. Yes, thank you also thank to, you our, so much, to all our P, uh, PSDS, especially to Dr. Minerva Rilio. Yes, thank you, Ma'am. Yes, thank you to our EPS in Science, Dr. Edwin R. Bermilio. Thank you so much, Paul. And with that, let us always keep in mind to um, relearn, unlearn, and learn, especially yes. in this new normal. For us teachers, it's important and it's very, very important. Yes. So, to end this, it's my honor to present to you my partner, Sir mm -hmm. Joel Kayabiab of Bataan School of Fisheries. And my partner, Mom Jessa Destresa of the Anpare Elementary School, saying, We're signing up. Thank you and Mabuhay. Mabuhay.